Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Latin American Directions. I am Nicolas Usman from Bogota, and today we have a starring wonderful guest. We have Catalina Fernandez Carter. She got a JD from Universidad de Chile, a Master in International Law from the University of Cambridge, and she's a lecturer in International Law, International Criminal Law, and International Humanitarian Law at Universidad de Chile, Universidad Diego Portales, and Universidad Alberto Hurtado. And currently, she works as legal advisor at the Chilean Constitutional Convention. Catalina, what a pleasure. Welcome to Latin American Directions. Sorry, thank you so much, Nicolás. It's a pleasure to be remotely in Hawaii. I'm trying to imagine the beaches, but well, that's the best I have for now. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And let's bring Santiago closer to Hawaii, if you wish. So the last two years for Chile have been of amazing transformation, I would say. And a very interesting case of social transformation in our region. So let's provide our viewers a bit of context. I understand that this whole social transformation began in 2019 with an increase in the fare for the metro ticket. How do we go from the metro ticket increase to a new constitution and to the election of a very atypical president as Gabriel Boric? Yes, that's a very good question indeed. Um, so the situation in Chile, it's a bit hard to, to summarize uh, because as you mentioned, everything happened very fast. So in October 2019, the Ministry, the Secretary of uh, Transportation announces that the metro, metro ticket will uh, suffer a, uh, an important race. Uh, and this started a protest initially, initially uh, organized by students um, of like high school students who were protesting against this increase, basically arguing that the life uh, in, in Chile and in Santiago was too expensive and even uh, transportation was unaffordable for a part of the, um, of the citizens. And for some reason that sometimes it's hard to explain why, why precisely at this moment, this, uh, student protests led to a massive gathering of people in the streets of Santiago and also the major uh, cities of the country, uh, claiming not only for a uh, reduced fare in the, for the metro, but more significantly, uh, uh, a change in the way that the Chilean system um, worked, the possibility for the uh, country to recognize social rights to advance forward in some key areas such as education, health, um, pensions, etc. Uh, and all this at some moment became a, a constitutional matter. And then if the protest started in October 2019, mid-November, we already had an agreement at the con Congress uh, to discuss a new constitution. Uh, why? Well, hard to explain. Maybe this was like the final drop that uh, people were just fed up. They didn't want to uh, keep on suffering the inequalities that the Chilean society has. Uh, we have often heard that Chile is some kind of example in the region because we are a pro prosperous country, but still a very unequal one. Um, so in some way, just a minimum change as the price of the metro, uh, created this movement for uh, equality, for real distribution of wealth, and finding that the current, the, the, the Pinochet constitution, which was established during the dictatorship, was part of the reason why this country could not move forward. So yeah, it was quite, um, quite a change in just a couple of weeks, uh, what happened, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And then my question would be, why now, right? Because as you said, this was the dictatorship constitution, right? In the 90s, well, late 80s, early 90s, there was a vote to, to remove the dictatorship and enter into a democracy. Uh, and what one would think that maybe that was the time for a change in constitution. So I don't know, maybe this is a very hard question, but why not then and yes, now? 
where there 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 were claims to and like um, some groups were uh, asking for a constitutional change very early in the 90s. So for those who, that are uh, listening to this and are not very aware of the Chilean history, the Pinochet dictatorship ended in early 1990, right? March 1990 is the start of the democracy, again, when Pinochet hands over the power to President Elwin. Um, and very soon, some groups started claiming that we had a constitution that was not legitimate because it was established during the dictatorship. Uh, without any participation from the public and was subject to a referendum that was highly questionable. So even though it was in some way, there was a, um, an election, a, a decision by the uh, people to decide whether they wanted this new constitution drafted by the dictatorship, this was an election which took place during gross violations of human rights. So it was not a legitimate uh, election. Um, but these movements in the early 90s and 2000s even were not really popular. And in 2005, uh, President Ricardo Lagos made some very significant amendments to the 1980 constitution. Even he tried to claim that this was a new constitution, the 2005 constitution, because the, some of the changes were quite substantial. Um, however, this argument at some, finally, no, nobody actually understood these amendments as a new constitution. And in the late, I don't know, in the last five to 10 years, the idea that the constitution was somehow an obstacle to development became more and more evident. Uh, because the constitution, even though amended in 2005, still represented a specific economic model a specific role of the state, which was not a very significant role. I mean, the, the 1980 constitution uh, established a subsidiary role for the state, and this did not allow for the state to be strong in the guarantee of social rights. Uh, so several like academics and politicians started arguing that actually this was a problem of legitimacy, but also that the constitution in practice did not allow for some significant changes. And there are quite a few examples, examples of uh, legal reforms that were actually very popular and demanded by the public on areas as diverse as education and water, sanitization, that were not possible to modify because of the constitution, because the constitutional court would then say, this is not possible. The constitution does not allow these changes, these improvements. So in, 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 in practice, the, the 1980 constitution did not allow for some um, measures that were very much um, claimed by the citizenship. And that is one of the reasons why finally on November 2019, after weeks of very massive protests, we had a 1 million people protest in Santiago around five people, five million people live in Santiago. So one out of five persons were in the protest. Uh, this ended up in this discussion to, to change the constitution to allow for this progressive agenda that an important part of the population was uh, asking for. Right, right. Uh, I think to understand this, uh, uh, Catalina, we should go back to the economic model in the previous constitution, right? Or in the current, soon to be previous, constitution, hmm. right? Uh, because I think what is behind all of this is an individual discontent with the situation, a series of limitations that really affect the individual and family spectrum of, of people. And, and Chile has been called uh, the golden child of neoliberalism in Latin America, right? Uh, yeah. It has been called uh, the textbook example of how public uh, how public uh, restraint, how freedom to the market, how privatization brings development, but you also raise how this development does not impact or significantly impact or is shared by the individual citizen. So I don't know if you could tell us a bit about uh, the, how was the life of, of individual citizens within this model, right? And why they feel so unhappy and they need to change the constitution because the model does not work for them, even if Chile is doing better at the macro level than other countries in the region, right? 
Yes, I mean, firstly, it's it's important to to recognize that Chile has experienced significant development in the last 20, 30 years. Uh, Chile has been able to uh, um, reduce its poverty levels during the 90s and 2000s, and it experienced some significant growth, especially when comparing it to some of its neighbors. It was a more stable democracy, um, a more stable economy as well, especially compared to our immediate neighbors. Um, and this is not something that one should deny. However, this neoliberal model that was established by the 18, 1980 constitution was established by force. We cannot ignore that fact. It was established by a military dictatorship that was killing and disappearing its citizens at the same time that it was drafting the constitution. And very famously, there is a letter um, between Milton Friedman, who is like the main uh, scholar that developed this neoliberalism, uh, and Margaret Thatcher. And Margaret Thatcher, who is, of course, um, not famous for being very progressive, stated that the economic model that was established in Chile, even though she considered it was positive, it was impossible to establish in the UK because it was incompatible with basic guarantees uh, of democracy and uh, representation of people and uh, several guarantees that the uh, British population would not, simply not uh, accept. So this was a model that was imposed by force, that in a democratic country would not, as Margaret Thatcher vividly explained, it would not be possible to establish this model in a democratic country. Um, and how this, this, this model affected everyday lives? Well, as I was explaining, the model implied that the state had a very limited role in the guarantee of social rights. So very basic things that in other countries are considered totally acceptable and normal, such as regulating basic requirements for education, even private education, or establishing, for instance, just to give one example, there was one uh, bill of law to impose additional requirements for school headmasters to make sure that they would be able to properly administer a school and properly be aware of educational methods and I don't know. And that law was considered not, uh, how do you say, inconstitutional, not, not against the constitution. Right. It was considered that just establishing more requirements for a school headmaster to make sure that he would or she would properly fulfill his or her role was incompatible with the basic idea of freedom of education, which entailed basically that anyone could create a school without any requirements and without any concern for the child's right to education, which should be the primary concern of any state. You're not, you should not be concerned with the business of creating uh, a school, but with how to guarantee a, chill, a child's right to education. Mm -hmm. So just a very basic, not even a restriction, just a very basic requirement for establishing a school or for managing a school was considered contrary to the constitution. And examples like this, we have thousands of them. So it was very, uh, it became quite impossible to, to imagine this neoliberal model recognizing basic guarantees as the right to education uh, with, a, with a reasonable like, level of, quali of like, uh, good quality of education, or again, health or pension funds or et cetera. Um, so I think this model uh, was really incompatible with the desires of the great majority of the population, which wanted the country to move forward and maybe some somehow um, follow the experiences of European countries that have developed a good, uh, like the UK, a good public health system, which does not mean that we're about to turn into Venezuela, which is of course always the, the myth that if we're changing the constitution, if we have a left-wing government right now, we're turning into Venezuela, when what most of the population won was actually just a very good and strong public healthcare system as the one the UK has. 
and no one would argue that the UK is a communist country, right? Um, so I think those are like the basic ideas of how just guaranteeing social rights was impossible under, and it was proven to be impossible under the current constitution. Right, right, an absolute need to change the rules of the game, right? Yeah. Otherwise you, you would not progress. And Catalina, you offer a fantastic segue into our, our next topic that is the new president, which also I find fascinating perhaps and a very interesting character, right? So Latin America, and we have discussed this in previous shows, is always in the dichotomy between the left and the right. Yeah. And there's a fear, an underlying fear of certain sectors and perhaps of a significant sector of the population regarding the left, right? Because of the experience that we've, we've had in the region with Venezuela, with Nicaragua, to some extent Bolivia, to some extent uh, consequences in Argentina and so on. So there's a big fear of the left, right? And not only of the left because of its social policies, but also of the left we've had in Latin America that align somehow with authoritarian policies, right? That is not consubstantial to the left, but that has been the case, right? In the midst of this, we see a new character as Gabriel Boric that seems completely different, that straight up criticized this left government uh, that has not even been done by other left figures in the region, such as Petro in Colombia, for example, who's shy of speaking against these governments and, and so on. So tell us a bit, Gabriel Boric, and how he's different uh, from this left, even being a leftist president, right? Yeah, so Gabriel Boric is, as you said, quite a character. Um, he does not really fit well into the classic, classic stereotype of left-wing Latin American politician, even Chilean left-wing politician. Um, but the first thing to say is that Chile is, I would dare to say, mostly a center left con wing country. We were ruled by the left wing, the center left wing, let's say, from the end of the dictatorship for 20 years until Piñera arrived in his first government. Then we again had a left wing government, a socialist government with President Bachelet and then Piñera again. Uh, so the last 30 years we have been mostly ruled by the left starting with the center left with the christian democracy um democratic party which is left wing in chile center left and then by socialist presidents such as lagos and, and bachelet um, and they have already shown that the let's say the chilean way the left wing in chile is different from other um left-wing parties in Latin America. Both Lagos and Bachelet proved to be quite responsible presidents, which had a left-wing agenda, but were also, but whose agenda was also compatible with basic ideas of growth, of international relations, of cooperation, of free trade agreements, etc. cetera, right? Uh, of course, Gabriel Boric is, is a bit different. He would probably call himself left-wing and not center-left, as some of the previous presidents would say, but he, he was a student leader first. He was the president of his student federation in Uni University of Chile. Um, then he was a member of Congress, one of the youngest uh, ever. He, start, he entered into Congress with some of his colleagues from the student movement. He was a member of Congress for two periods and now suddenly and not really expected, uh, he won the presidency. At, at the beginning, we didn't even think he was going to get the necessary supports to present his, uh, uh, to present himself as a candidate because he first needed to get some, some popular support. Um, and he's a very particular figure. He acknowledges quite often that he makes mistakes He's very good at recognizing his previous mistakes. He has a very, let's say, humble approach to politics. He has no problem in admitting that he was, when he was younger, he maybe was more extreme than he is right now. Some people call, say that he has moderated in a certain way, especially um, for like during the presidential election. Uh, he is in the government with the Communist Party, which I know for some people may seem unacceptable, but this is actually not the first time the Communist Party has been in power in Chile. During the Bachelet presidency, the Communist Party was also in the government. 
and nothing happened. We didn't turn into Venezuela. Our communist party is quite different to other communist parties in the region. Uh, so sometimes some of the myths that exist around this left wing and this attempt to compare it with other countries do not recognize this, this, the, the difference of every social movement in every country, right? So Gabriel Boric has been very critical of Venezuela, calling it a dictatorship without any um, problem. He has been extremely critical of Nicaragua, even though Nicaragua was originally like an example for the Latin American left wing. Now for the Russian invasion to Ukraine, he did not do what some left wing governments did, like this somehow vague reference that this was NATO's uh, fault. Uh, on the contrary, he was quite clear in supporting Ukraine and, uh, and calling Russia's actions unacceptable under international law. Um, so I think he represents a new way, a new, a new style, let's say, a new approach in Latin American politics and also in Chile. I think he's quite special even for Chile. And that is why so many people relate even personally to him. He's very liked. People want to hug him, like all these things that have, I don't know, never, but maybe only with Michel Bachelet happened before in Chile. Uh, people want to know about his dog. He's like a friendly, approachable character. And this is something quite new for Chilean politics and probably even for Latin American politics. Mm -hmm. So that makes him reliable. People actually think that he's trying to do the best that he can. And of course, this comes with an agenda that will be um, developed in the next few months. He also, even though he, he comes from the less traditional left wing, he now started government with some of the parties that have ruled Chile for the last 20 to 30 years. Uh, his, uh, some of his ministers are socialist members of the Socialist Party that in Chile that shows uh, a certain, like say, continuity with the previous governments that were also socialist. Um, so I would, I would call people to, to, to give Gabriel Boric an opportunity to stop assuming that just because he's left wing, he's going to be the next Nicolás Maduro or whatever other example we find in the region. He's very young. He's from a new generation. And he's responding to the specific, the specific situation in Chile. He does not follow the, the traditional claims of other uh, leftist uh, leaders in the region. So as for me, I am very hopeful for this process. Of course, one always has to be a little skeptical. One has to wait to see what happens. Uh, but I'm actually looking forward to see how this new generation of politicians, not only him, he comes along with the new secretaries of state, which are very young as well, um, gives this country, let's say, a new opportunity. We don't know whether he will succeed or not, but it was quite clear that this country needed a significant change. Um, and at least this generation is offering a change with stability at the same time with some continuity, but trying to follow some of the progressive agenda that, that has been claimed by the, by the Chilean population. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I couldn't agree more with you. I think it's going to be a very interesting experiment. I also personally have a lot of hope, right? Uh, I, I've said it in this show before that the left-right categories are not anymore the primary categories to assess Latin American and even world politics. I would do it first in the democratic authoritarian axis, yeah. and then we can see the, the left and right, yeah? Um, so I think Boric could be a very good example of a democratic, open, left government. Pro-human um, pro rights as well. Pro-human rights. Been, he has been quite clear that human rights everywhere are like his basic priority. And that's also different from other left-wing governments, I would say. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I couldn't agree more. And I also have a lot of expectations. Chile has been a model in the past for other Latin American countries, mine included. I hope it could be a good example with this new government as well. Catalina, just to close a final reflection uh, from your side. So all of this started with very strong demonstrations, right? Very violent demonstrations. Demonstrations are easily attacked and disqualified by certain sectors of the population that say that demonstrations and public outreach 
uh, should be done with certain level of moderation, with certain level of control. And what we saw in Chile was very, very strong, right? Very strong. The images are, are shocking, right? Um, and then we we see we saw that in, in Colombia the same year, and then last year we see it in, in Europe at the moment, we see it in Russia against the invasion. So we're, we saw it in the US in 2020 with the Black Lives Matter. Um, I would like to see your, to know your views about this. What would you say to these people that say that demonstrations, that violent demonstrations do not lead to change? And if you think that such a transformation in Chile could have been achieved through more peaceful demonstrations or to less strong demonstrations or to control demonstrations? Well, it's hard to tell. We have had very massive demonstrations in the past as well, which led to, to some change, but of course not this constitutional change, which probably is the most radical change we have experienced as a country. One can never know whether peaceful demonstrations, they, they, they were very massive. So I think the number was also very important in, in pushing up politicians to, for, for this decision to, to, to agree on this constitutional process. But of course there was violence and there were some uh, fires and several metro stations were destroyed during the protests as well. Um, I do not support violent protests. I think the basic human right is to of peaceful protest. However, I think it's always crucial to differentiate and realize that the group of population of, of people that um, use violence as a mean are a minority. And I think what was crucial in Chile, and I would like this to be my final point, is that luckily the politicians were able to see that we have a political problem. We have this peaceful and violent protests, we're going to give them an institutional solution, which is a new constitution. We could have ended with a coup d'etat, with the military taking over. But instead, we, we opted, we decided to have a legitimate process, an institutional process to change the constitution. And I think that is something to be valued because it could have been different. Maybe the military could have taken power again. But then the politicians said, no, no, there's an institutional way to, to solve these claims, to give these people an answer. And I think that it is some of what is unique of the Chilean experience. And I think that was a good decision. Uh, and I think that actually helped uh, reducing the violence, not completely, of course, but reducing the violence and giving more legitimacy to those that were protesting uh, peacefully. Absolutely, absolutely. I just would, would just close with that, with the importance of listening, with the importance of going for the message instead of the means, and don't let violence and disruption to be equated, right? I think demonstrations should be disruptive, and does, that does not mean violence. Mm -hmm. And Catalina, we will keep looking at Chile uh, experiment, I, I would say would be a good it's, it's, it's a new hope, perhaps, in the horizon for, for the rest of Latin America. Thank you very much, Catalina. This was Latin American Directions, and see you, everyone, in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.